Well, good morning. Pastor Brad is gone on vacation. I'll give you two guesses where he's at. Mama. Yeah, Mama. Uh, <laughs> and um, that's in South Carolina. So he's there today and um, wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't probably preaching somewhere, maybe for his twin brother, Bart. But uh, later on today, I imagine he'll be back out on the lake. Uh, he found a a nice gentleman who loaned him his boat, so I have a feeling he's, other than his mama's cooking, he's out on that boat fishing every day, I suppose. But uh, you remember him and the family as they enjoy their time together. And uh, I'm going to encourage you to turn to chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke. And if you have a cell phone and you do texting, I want you to turn your phone on. Usually you get in public places like this and they tell you to turn it off, but once in a while when I'm preaching, I will have a little contest and I've got one such contest today. So turn on your phones if you text and you might win um, the prizes. Um, I've got in my library sometimes duplicate copies of certain books, and this is a classic. This is by C.S. Lewis, a wonderful Christian intellectual theologian. He is deceased now, but uh, this is one of his many books called The Screwtape Letters, and it's uh, subtitled How a Senior Devil Instructs a Junior Devil in the Art of Temptation. It's an amazing book, really a great little book, a devotional book. And uh, so whoever wins this contest gets the book. And you'll say, big deal, it's a used book. Um, well, that's true. But I'm going to sweeten the deal because I've got an Idaho spud bar candy bar to go with it. Now, you'll say, spud bar? There's no potatoes in this. Uh, it's got two kinds of chocolate and it's got... Um, Coconut sprinkles on it. It's a good. It's a good candy bar. As far as I know, you can only get them in Idaho. Uh, and since I was up there recently, I bought a case of them. So um, I did. I like them. How many of you have had a Spud Bar? Okay. Ask them. They're good. They're good candy bars. So <clears throat> here's the contest. You're going to prepare to text to that number that's showing on the screen. So put that in in the heading of where you're setting it. And then in the message, you need to put your first and last name. And then you're going to try to put the answer to this question. I was amazed at how long it took last time. Uh, I guess I just assumed something that wasn't true. So, in the story of the prodigal son, if you've heard that story, what one word is most often used to describe the word prodigal. One word. And once you get that word, text it, send it off as quick as you can, because once, once Andy gets it up there, he's going to let me know he's got a winner, and we're going to announce it. What one word is most often used to define the word prodigal? Prodigal. Don't shout it out. Don't say it. That doesn't help. It's got to be a text game here, okay? And we're going to be in Luke chapter 15 as they work on this. And um, there are a handful of Bible stories that most everyone has heard, even people who have never gone to church. They will hear about certain Bible stories. For instance, uh, it's, it's rare to find somebody, at least in our own country, oh, we've got a winner. Richard Pennington, where are you, Richard? Come on up here, Richard. Good job. Have you ever had this book? Screw tape. Oh, good. Have you ever had an Idaho Spud Bar? I'm surprised. No, that's great. Good. I think you'll enjoy both of them. Don't eat that in the church right now, though. Wait, wait till a little later on, because you'll get ganged up on. Everybody will want to know just what is an Idaho Spud Bar. All right. So. Most people, at least in this country, I've run onto, and by the fact that I see these things mentioned in TV shows and in movies, most people have heard at least part of the story of Adam and Eve. 
A lot of people know about Noah, and the story of Noah. Most people have heard of Moses. Most people know of David and Goliath. These are all stories that are referred to in secular settings, in worldly settings that have nothing to do with church. And in the New Testament, I have heard in, uh, in secular circles of, of, for instance, a TV show one time or a movie, somebody walks through the door and somebody in that room says, oh, the prodigal returns. Oh, by the way, prodigal, it means wasteful. That's what it means, wasteful. So most people have heard at least the story of the prodigal son if they have not heard the whole story. So let's look at the story. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. Then he, that's Jesus, said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger son came to him and said, Father, let me have the inheritance that falls to me. And so his father divided up his inheritance and gave the younger son his portion of it. A few days later, the younger son gathered up all that he had and he went off to a foreign country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living, wasteful living. But when he had spent all that he had, a famine arose in the land and he began to be in want, in need. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have enough bread to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your sons. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he, the older son, was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, all these many years, I have served you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, you who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And his father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make Mary and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. 
This is one of those parables where I wish I knew the rest of the story. There's lots of details of this story that were not told. And uh, I shouldn't let little details bother me, but sometimes my mind does look at things. I, for instance, I wonder what these boys were named. I'd really like to know their names. I don't know why, and I have a tendency to, to make them up. But it, it occurred to me as I was studying the passage, I realized there was a time in my life when the younger son was named Kevin, because I, I was all about getting out of life what was mine and being wasteful with it. Some other things I, I don't know uh, because of the way the story ends. How long was he in that foreign land? We're really not sure. It doesn't really say. It was long enough to spend all he had and when he finally came home, did the older brother ever become convinced that his younger brother had changed his ways? Did he ever accept him back? We're just not told. We're just sort of left hanging by the story. I also wonder if the younger brother, uh, he's not going to get any inheritance even though he's home. He's spent that all. Was he ever able to make a place for himself? I just wonder. I have a feeling he probably did. I have a feeling he realized and changed his ways and became a hard worker. I would be surprised to find out if there was uh, many pastors who had been at it a while preaching who have never preached on the prodigal son story. But I want to talk about a few things that the younger son did right. We all can see the mistakes that he made, but he did some things right. One of the things he did was he came to himself. That means he came to his senses. There, when he was there feeding the swine, he realized, what am I doing? Why am I here? Why, the guys who work for my father are in better shape than I am now. Second thing that he did right was he recognized, and this is the flip coin, the flip side of the coin of, of coming to his senses, he recognized how stupid and how foolish he'd been. Now, I recognize also in our, in our culture, uh, politically correct situations, um, the word stupid has been tried to be eliminated. In fact, I, was, I remember talking one time, and there was a little girl with her parent in, in the room we were talking and, and I was talking along and all of a sudden the little girl whispered to his mom. She was just shocked and she whispered to her mom. She said, he said the S word. And I, I looked, I was shocked because my S word was something different than her S word. <laughs> Did I? No, I didn't say that. And the mother smiled and she said, you said stupid. Well, yes, I did. And they're, they're taught not to say that, which is good. My dad always got onto us when we called each other stupid in the family. But at times it, it describes what's going on. And in this story, this young man was stupid. He was foolish for what he did. For, fortunately, he didn't stay that way. He, he came to his senses and he went home. A third thing that I want to point out that he did right was before he went home, he made a plan of repentance. He, he sat down and he worked out his apology to his father. He worked out where he was going to go. He was going home. He worked out who he was going to see when he got there. He was going to go straight to his father. He worked out what he was going to do. He was going to humble himself and confess his sin. And the fourth thing he did, he, he worked out exactly what he would say. I have sinned. And we read the rest of the words that he, that he put in there. Those are right things that he did. Now allow me to throw a curveball at you before I share some other things. And, and I think of these things as being kind of obvious, but, but from, the, from the first uh, service, wasn't maybe so obvious. First question, 
had the younger son done wrong to his father? Yes. Yes, he had. He brought dishonor to his father for the way he treated him. His father hadn't died. Give me your inheritance. You know, I like the bumper sticker I see on some cars on a big RV. We are spending our children's inheritance. Um, enjoy it if you got it, I guess. But, but he had dishonored his father not only by asking for the inheritance before his dad died, then he went and he spent it in a frivolous, immoral way. Brought dishonor not only to him, but to the family name. Okay, second question. Had he also sinned against God? Yes. Yes, he had. And he said so. Well, how did he sin against him? Well, he broke at least one commandment. He did not honor his father and mother. And from what the older brother said, that he'd spent all the inheritance on harlot, he had broken another commandment. So, he had certainly sinned against God. What finally caused him to come to his senses? Hunger? Hunger, right, right. Feeding pigs don't always bring you to your senses. It should. My, my wife had an uncle and they had a pig farm. It was an amazing place, but not a place I wanted to work. But it was fun to go out and watch him, you know, in different stages. But it wasn't just feeding the pigs, the fact that he was hungry. That's what brought him to his senses. Next question. Whose fault was it that he was hungry? His own fault. His own fault. Remember that. Now, was he better off going home than staying where he was at? Sure he was. That's the point of the story. He came to his senses. Is it fair for me to say, had he never gotten hungry, he might have never gotten right with God and his own father? Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes, I believe, I believe it is. So listen carefully to what I'm about to say. This is not a blanket statement by which you or I can live our life. Uh, this is not a license for you or for me to turn our back on the needy. When you know the circumstances of a given situation, it is very important to seek God's will on how to best help a person in need because you might be thwarting God's will. Case in point, the prodigal son. I believe it was the right thing to do for him to go back home. And uh, if he'd gotten a whole lot of food, he might have never gone home. But his hunger drove him home. There's a lot of things that can drive us home. And when God begins applying pressure on a wayward son or daughter or family member, when God begins applying a pressure on them, you don't want to get between them and God. You'll start getting the pressure. How are we going to know this? Well, that's why each case has to be taken very carefully. You really need to know the circumstances about situations. And if you don't know, don't assume you know. And just pray and ask God. There are times in our lives where we need to be prepared to say no. Now, it's a rare, rare day when your church staff ever turns somebody away when they come seeking help. But there have been occasions. And, and we believe it was, it was justified. Now, I want to talk about some life lessons out of the story of the prodigal son. First life lesson. Base your decisions of how you're going to go through life. Base your decisions on what is right, not on what people think of your choices. That seems to be kind of common sense, and yet it seems like the older I get, the more I'm starting to think there may be no such thing as common sense. I have at times made choices based on what people thought, not based on what I thought was right. I have yielded to peer pressure. 
I have yielded to my own lust of what I wanted to do, my own selfishness, when I knew what was right and I chose not to do what was right. So base your decisions on what is right. Not everybody's going to be happy with your decisions. Right or wrong, they're not going to be happy. Was his father happy with his decisions to gather up all his belongings and leave home? What do you think? No, no, he wasn't happy with it. Was the older son happy with his decision to come home? No. About the only two people who weren't happy was him and the fatted calf. It's sinking in. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Not everybody's happy with our decisions, right or wrong. So we still have to be determined to do the right thing. That's life lesson number one. Number two, you know this. Your choices have consequences. You may make a choice. It's a bad decision. And you end up with consequences. You end up with problems in your life. And sometimes those problems aren't going to go away. That doesn't mean you can't be forgiven. The father, in the story of the prodigal son, forgave his son. As soon as he saw his son, he ran to him. He knew why the boy was coming home. The son only got half of his apology out, and the father just fell on his neck and kissed him and, and blessed him with gifts. But the father couldn't undo the consequences of a lost inheritance. The boy spent it. It was gone. There wasn't going to be any more inheritance. The father could not undo that. There are consequences to our choices. And we have to live with those. I've heard people say, well, you're just not forgiving me. No, I, I forgive you. you. You realize that the consequences. Somebody might make a bad decision and get high with drugs or alcohol or whatever, crash their car, and in that car lose their arm. They can find forgiveness, but they may never get their arm back. That's a consequence. It doesn't mean you can't be forgiven. Life lesson number three from the prodigal son. Never assume you are deserving of forgiveness. Because if you ever do that, you are lacking humility. And there are people who go through life just thinking they deserve a lot. Never assume you are deserving of forgiveness. When God gives us forgiveness, it is a great blessing of mercy. It's not something you deserve. When somebody that you have offended gives you forgiveness, it's not something you deserve. And yet so often when we have been the offender, it's much easier to think, such an easy thing, why don't you just forgive me? But when you're the, the one who's been offended, it's a hard thing to forgive. So don't assume you deserve forgiveness. When it comes, it's a gift. Number four, people can change. God can change them. God can change you and me. It's at this point that I recognize Kevin's no longer the name of the younger son because in my life, I recognize I'm far too often the older son. I'm far too judgmental. I'm far too unforgiving. I don't want to forgive. What's wrong with me? I should know this. Christ forgave me far greater than what anybody's done to me. People can change. We need to give them that opportunity. Now, only one person... Richard got the, got the prize today on, on that. Well, there was a prize given out in the early service too. Um, but I want to give a gift to all of you. I'm sorry it's not another book and it's certainly not another Idaho spud bar, okay? But I do have a gift that I want to give you. And it's a gift 
that you may not open for a while. See, this, is, this here is a Christmas present I got last Christmas. You might say, what's in it? I don't know, I haven't opened it. It's just so nice. Now you would think, you got a Christmas present and you haven't opened it yet? That's stupid. Yeah, that's right. She said the S word. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Actually, what's in this box is, is the gift that I'm going to give you. And it is maybe not going to be needed in your life for a while. You may keep it wrapped up and saved, but I can just about guarantee you, you're going to need this gift. And one day you can unwrap this gift and bring it out and use it to help perhaps restore a broken or damaged relationship in your life. It, the gift is how to make a proper apology. And I am amazed at how few people know how to make a proper apology. And somebody had shared this gift with me years ago and I realized when I heard it, I thought, I didn't know how to make a proper apology. And I have been trying to follow these steps that I'm going to share with you. And, and God has blessed me with restoring a number of broken relationships in my life. And I'm grateful to God and I'm grateful to the man that shared it with me. So, number one on how to make a proper apology. When you begin to consider a broken or a damaged relationship in your life, Ask God to reveal to you any wrong that you may have committed in it. And do not justify your bad behavior. For instance, you may think, well, I'll apologize when they apologize. They started it. I just carried it on. Think about only what you have done. Ask God to show you what you've done wrong in it, not what they've done wrong. You probably can list that right on down the line, but think about, is there anything you've done, even if they started, anything that you've done that was, not, that was not right, any wrongdoing you've done? Number two, once you have realized that you've done wrong in it, confess that wrong to God as sin. Try to step outside yourself and see your sin as God sees your sin. And if we can ever get to that place, then when the time comes to make an apology, it will come across sincere. Have you ever received an insincere apology? You just know it's insincere. And you don't want to be a person who gives an insincere apology. It's better not to say anything. Um, I've seen plenty of insincere apologies uh, during recess. A couple of boys get into it. They haul them in. Okay, now I want you to both say you're sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry I didn't knock your teeth out. <laughs> insincere apologies are useless. They're even worse than useless. Number three, decide that you will seek the forgiveness of the other person face-to-face, -face, if at all possible, if that's feasible. Now, this is very hard, but it's important. When you make the apology, if there's any way you can make it face-to-face, -face, it, it'll have a greater impact. They'll be able to see you, not only hear your voice, but see you. I did have one occasion where I had to make an apology over the phone because I just really could not get to that person uh, due to the circumstances. And still, he graciously forgave me. And our, our, our relationship has been cemented back like it, like it had never happened after, after all these years. Number four, write out exactly what you plan to say when you ask forgiveness. Because I can just about guarantee you, if you don't write it out, if you don't rehearse it like the prodigal son did, when you get there to say something, chances are you'll say something wrong. I just want you to know how sorry I am for 
for how I treated you through this. But you know, quite frankly, you were a real jerk. <laughs> you laugh, but that happens a lot. You know, I didn't, I'm sorry for what I did, but I'd have never done it if you hadn't done that other thing. See, we, we tend to apologize, but we point at why we did our bad thing because it was their fault. That's not an apology. That's a blame game. Concentrate on what you're going to say. Rehearse it. Say it out loud. It's amazing how when it goes out of your mouth and into your ears and you can go, that sounds right or that sounds stupid. Con you know, and so through this, you're there to apologize for what you did and your apology should sound something like this. I owe you an apology for, for what I did or what I said. And then you list what it is. And I had no right to say that. I had no right to do that. Will you forgive me? And I would encourage you to use, close your apology with those words, will you forgive me? That puts it back into their hands. Number five, once you've rehearsed your apology, call them to set up a meeting and a time of their choice and convenience to meet with them. Don't take the easy way out and tell them, I want to apologize to you. But I really want to do it face to face and, and try to set that time up. And be prepared that they might say, oh, there's no reason to do that. You would then say, thank you. That's kind of you to say so. But it's important to me. I really need to see you. I really need to, to do this face to face. Would you allow me that? And, uh, and try to set that time up. Um, that, that's, that's number six, to, to be prepared that they might try to say it's not necessary. Number seven, once you get to them, you're through the apology, be prepared that they may not be ready to forgive you. This is where it's important to remember you and I can't run around thinking we're deserving of forgiveness. If they're not prepared to forgive you, don't demand forgiveness. Just say something like this. If you ever can find in your heart to forgive me, would you let me know? Okay, number eight. After you say that, just thank them for letting you come by and quietly leave. Don't say anything like, I'll be praying for you. Because that is applying pressure and sometimes it can come across as a haughtiness. Some people will take it like this. I'm praying for you that you'll do the right thing, you rotten heathen. I've come here out of the graciousness of my heart to apologize and you won't forgive me. You're a crud. That's what you're saying when you say, I'm praying for you. Just, just thank them and quietly leave. Number nine. If they do not forgive you at that time, trust God to bring them around. Don't bring the subject up again. If you work with them, if you see them from time to time, don't say things like, remember, I asked, you haven't done it. Remember me, it's time, get this over with. Don't do that, just drop it, because believe me, they'll remember. Give God time to work in this situation. And number 10. The most important thing to remember is you and I apologize because we want a clear conscience before God. That's the most important thing. Do not let your pride get in the way of doing the right thing because pride will destroy you. It really will. Now my gift to you is that list of 10 things on a piece of paper. I'll leave them up here at the front following the close of the service. There's some out in this, right outside these doors and on one of those little uh, stool pads out there and there's some out here on the little, little floor if you, if you want that list of 10 things. We come now to the time of invitation and I want to ask you just to ask yourself, is there any broken or damaged relationships in your life that need to be healed, mended, made right. Cry out to God in your heart and ask Him to help 
mend those things and fix those relationships. At least get you to the point of where you've tried to do what you can to make it right. If, if you are not in right relationship with God, why not? He is a loving father who has opened his arms up and wants you, whether you're that prodigal son, whether you've never even lived in that house with God, and it's not that you need to uh, go back to home. You need to be adopted into his family. You can do that because of the blood of Jesus Christ paid the debt. He died on that cross so your sins would be forgiven. So he can make a change in you you can't make yourself and bring you into a family relationship with a loving Heavenly Father. Have you ever gotten to that point where you see the mess that you've made of your own life? And everybody might think, boy, you've got it all together. But you know inside you ache because there's something missing. Most likely it's that relationship with God. If you've gotten to that point where you're just tired of trying it your way, Maybe you're ready to turn to God to give you real life, life in Christ. If there's never been a time where you seriously cried out to God for the forgiveness of your sins, you can do that today. There's no reason to put it off. Do it today. If you have questions about that, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. I'd be glad to pray with you about it. But it's a decision that you're going to have to to turn your life over to God. You're going to have to confess to God that your sin has separated you. He's done everything he can to bring you home to him. Second part of the invitation is for each and every one of us who are born-again believers, children of God already. Are you up to date on your obedience with God? If not, I would encourage you to go back in your mind of where you got away from him. If you're not as close to God today as you have been in your life, then you're backslidden. You're away from him. What is it that's standing between you and God? What is it that you've let come between you and God? Confess that as sin. Return to God. He'll make, he'll make it right. He's willing to forgive you. Let's pray.